The colour of space reveals the beginning of a new stage in Lovecraft's development. The desire to create pure horror is vanishing. The best stories of the later period are weird science fiction rather than horror stories. They included The Whisper in the Dark, At the Mountains of Madness, and his final work, The Shadow Out of Time. All deal with the Fortean notions that beings from other galaxies or other dimensions visited our planet millions of years ago and that the remains of their civilizations can still be found. The Whisper in Darkness includes the disturbing suggestion that these aliens extract human brains, place them in metal cylinders and send them out all over the universe. But even this notion is attached without the usual attempts to make the flesh creep. Lovecraft was outgrowing horror. He now wants to invoke the immensity of the universe and the mysteries of space and time. When I wrote The Strength to Dream in 1960, I was interested simply in the qualities that Lovecraft shares with all other imaginative writers, the desire to jar the reader to a deeper perception of reality. Once we recognize this common denominator, we can see that there is no fundamental difference in aim between Lovecraft and Hemingway, between Theodore Desire and Georges Louis Borgia. Hemingway uses a flat colloquial language, but the aim is to lull the reader into a sense of security or acceptance. Once this has been achieved, the message is harsh and frightening. Death is the ultimate reality. Most human emotions are delusional. Man is alone in an empty universe. All imaginative writers start out from the recognition that everyday consciousness is trivial and limited. People only see what is in front of their noses. The aim of the writer is to convey his own larger and therefore truer vision of reality. The melodramatic devices of William Faulkner's early novels, murder, rape, suicide, violence, seem to have little in common with Lovecraft, but the aim is much the same, to shock the reader like a slap in the face. The trouble with Lovecraft's early stories is they give the game away before the final shock, with their overuse of adjectives. Instead of lulling the reader into a mood of acceptance, they arouse his suspicions. Only children would find them terrifying. Adults enjoyed them with tongue-in-cheek. This was the aspects of Lovecraft that concerned me in 1960s, particular use of imagination. But I said very little about another aspect that is equally important, his romanticism. Lovecraft was a romantic in the old sense word, the sense that describes Keats or Shelley or William Morris. It is true that he detests the modern world, but that is only the negative aspect of his own romanticism. Like all romantics, he was more interested in the world whose existence he could clearly sense, yet whose precise location escaped him. Keats would have called it the world of beauty, Shelley the world of the ideal. I suspected that Keats had been born in Providence in 1890. He might have well have written macabre fiction instead of sensuous poetry. Conversely, a Lovecraftian born in London a century earlier might well have written dreamlike poems full of imagery from Mallory and Spencer. What is even more important is to recognize precisely why any romantics dream of other worlds. The essence of romanticism is a mood of a relaxation that seems to open up an inner world. We live in the world of actuality like horse and harness, and the driver keeps us alert with the flicks of the whip. And this means that we are confined to the physical world trapped in the present. The interesting thing about the moods of relaxation is that the mind comes to be confined to the present. The body becomes quincescent while the mind travels and our feelings cease to be tied on a short reign. I can open an anthology of poetry and invoke a whole succession of emotions entering into each poem with the whole of my sensibility. It is as if someone had given me the key to the world inside myself. In short, as if someone had granted me a type of freedom almost unknown to human beings. This is the true, positive ideal of the Romantics, the strange freedom. Yet, it is accurate to describe it as a freedom to descend inside ourselves, if I am reading a volume of poetry, it would seem more accurate to say that I am wandering in the world of the poems. I am not exploring the external universe, but neither am I exploring my own mind. The world of poetry or ideas is a kind of a third world. Philosopher Karl Popper was the first to point out that it has its own independent existence. If some atomic catastrophe destroyed all our libraries and left only a handful of human beings suffering from a loss of memory, mankind would need thousands of years to achieve their present cultural level. But if the libraries were all intact, they might do it in a few generations. This world that lies inside books has its own kind of separate existence. But the third world is also the gateway to our own authentic inner world. I may lay down the book, stare out the window and daydream for hours. I may even sink into a state of such profound inner peace that I experience a kind of mystical revelation, like the hero of Lovecraft's favourite Mackin novel, The Hill of Dreams. Significantly, this work, which later I regard as Mackin's finest, has no supernatural element.
And now I think the reader will begin to see why I have devoted so much space to discussing the romantic impulse. It is not simply a matter of escapism or even of ordinary self-development. It is an exploration of an unknown realm of freedom. When I think of those moods of delight that I experience when reading poetry or listening to music, I can easily imagine a far greater degree of freedom, exploration of new planes of being inside myself. The basic insight of romanticism is that a man is potentially a god and that his evolution depends on his ability to explore this new realm of inner freedom. We may be mistaken to think of evolution in physical terms of development from the amoeba and the amphibian, but such development is infinitely slow. But if Huxley's superconscious theory is correct, then it seems plausible that in some sense man is already a god. His problem is to learn to explore the hierarchy of selves. And what all this means in turn is that we may be mistaken to think of Lovecraft merely as a writer of macabre fiction. He was a true romantic outsider, and his work would be seen as an attempt at personal evolution. Like all men of genius, for I think he undoubtedly possessed the degree of genius, he searched instinctively for what he needed. Miserable and out of place in a world of actuality, he made attempts to induce states of inner vision as Macken did that afternoon in Gray's Inn. We have seen that Macken's inner forces respond to the appeal and manifested their existence. The evidence of the Cthulhu tale suggests that the same kind of thing happened to Lovecraft. Why is it that the mythos had such a powerful appeal when Dusani's Pegnjana and Cabell's Pogstetmi have been more or less forgotten? It is because Cthulhu and the great old ones somehow strike a deeper chord. They seem to rise up from the age-long memorized self that Yeats believed could be contacted through symbols. Now, if Lovecraft had been a student of Gnosticism or Kabbalism, this would have been fairly unsurprising. The Gnostics believed that the world was created by a kind of demon and that the universe is a gigantic prison. Man's problem is to reject the material universe and struggle backwards towards God. The Gnostic tradition is closely related to the Jewish Mechaba or throne mysticism in which the mystic strives to reach the throne chariot of God by passing through a series of heavenly halls. Each of those has a guardian of the threshold. And the mystic had to combat three demons with various seals and sacred names. The tradition of the Kabbalah derives from both Gnosticism and Merkaba mysticism. It is based on the belief that when Adam sinned, he fell from union with God, down through the lower planes of consciousness into a state of total amnesia. His problem is to climb back through the nine realms above him, like Jack ascending the beanstalk. But then Kabbalism is more than a peculiar form of Jewish mysticism. It could be regarded as the foundation of all Western magic. These other planes of existence are, for example, the realms that the adepts of the Golden Dawn try to explore by means of symbol and ritual. They are the planes of our inner being, and in Mysteries I have pointed out how closely they seem to correspond with the notion of a ladder of selves, as well as with Jung's recognition of various points of the unconscious. The point that Keith Grant continues to make throughout the books of his remarkable Typhonian trilogy, The Magical Revival, Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God, Cults of the Shadow, is that Lovecraft can only be properly understood in the context of the whole mystery tradition. In his book on Crowley, Grant speaks of Lovecraft's occult experiences disguised as fiction and says that his poetry reveals the source of his visions. The intrusion of force is completely in accord with archetype symbols that Crowley brought through when in contact with the transmundane entity. He is particularly fascinated by Lovecraft's concept of other dimensions beyond their space-time and the mighty beings who are guardians of the threshold between our world and these other planes. And finally, in the most comprehensive study of the Dark Mysteries tradition, Nightside of Eden, Grant refers again and again to Lovecraft pointing out the similarities between Lovecraft's mythos and the magical traditions of East and West. And speaking of the novelist Sax Romer, who was once a member of the Golden Dawn, he writes, Romer, like H.P. Lovecraft, has direct and conscious experience of the inner planes and both established contact with non-spiritual entities. Furthermore, both these writers recoiled from actual confrontation with entities that are easily recognizable as the envoys of Shorazan Shagul, the guardians of the threshold, whom Grant seems to identify with Cthulhu. The masks of these entities achieved the quality of such compelling clarity that neither Romer nor Lovecraft were able to face what lay beneath. Yet the insurmountable abhorrence inspired by such 
contacts hidden magical potentials, compressed and explosive that made both of these writers master of their respective branches of creative occultism. He believes that Lovecraft hesitated and turned back on the brink of this abyss which lies between the seventh and eighth plane of existence and, as a consequence, spent his life in a vain attempt to deny the potent entities that moved him. After mentioning that Lovecraft hints at the existence of entities who tread the deeps of space between the stars, Grant goes on to say, historically speaking, Dr. John Dee, 1527 to 1608, was the first to leave any detailed account of the human traffic with Denzians of dimensionless gap between the universe. The mention of Dee's name in this context is interesting, not only because Lovecraft attributes to Dee the only English translation of the Necronomicon, but also because Dee is one of the few great magical adepts of the past who can present us with some practical evidence of the existence of non-human entities. Dee, who was Queen Elizabeth's astrologer, was himself devoid of paranormal power powers, but he worked with a number of scryers and seers, the scryer, one who sees. The most talented of these was one Edward Kelly, an Irishman who was something of a rogue. Nonetheless, he seems to have been what we would nowadays call a medium. Through the mediumship of Kelly, who probably gazed into crystals or glasses of water, Dee held long conversations with spirits, which he recorded in some thousands of pages. The interesting thing to note is that at the time, in the 1580s, no one had ever heard of what we now call spiritualism. This began in the 19th century when the house of the Fox family in New York State was haunted by rapping noises and the spirits identified themselves as a murdered peddler. Excavation more than half a century later revealed a man's skeleton and a peddler's box just outside the walls of the cellar. Nowadays, it seems clear enough that Dee and Kelly were doing what countless mediums have done since 1848, when the rappings were first heard. The entities who communicated through Kelly did not identify themselves as spirits of the dead, but as angels and various other spirits. But this may have had something to do with Dee's own expectations, for there can be no doubt whatsoever whether spirits really exist or not. The human subconscious mind plays an important part in the mediumistic phenomena. I am a come to suspect that most spirits are disembodied entities, but they are not what they claim to be. They could be the crooks or con men of the spirit world, or simply bored delinquents with nothing better to do than play games with gullible humans. Now Kelly was undoubtedly a rogue, and common sense would suggest that Dee's experience with spirits should be regarded as unproven, but there is one important piece of evidence in his favour. The spirits declared that they would provide a series of magical invocation or keys in the ancient language called Enochian. The Book of Enoch is the apocryphal book of the Old Testament, describing how angels had intercourse with the daughters of men and passed on to them the basic secrets of magic and occultism. In Dee's day, it survived only in fragments, although the traveller Bruce was to bring back a copy of the whole work from Abyssinia in 1773. It is of course written in Hebrew, not Enochian, but these spirits identified the language of the keys as one of these angels in the book of Enoch. And the extraordinary thing is that that Enochian is a language with its own grammar and syntax. Crowley writes in his autobiography, it is very much more stately and impressive than even Greek or Sanskrit, and the English translation, though in places difficult to understand, contains passages of sustained sublimity. Admittedly, this kind of claim arouses a natural scepticism, since Crowley obviously had reason to exaggerate, but the supporting evidence is highly convincing. The basic Enochian texts amount to 19 keys, the longest being about 300 words. Most amount to about 100. A dictionary of Enochian compiled by Leo Vinci contains about 900 words. If we assume that Kelly invented the language, then we must suppose that the, he first of all translated a series of invocations into consistent Enochian, then memorized them all. But there is far more to it than that. These had a series of tablets consisting of 49 by 49 squares. Most squares contained letters or symbols. He would sit with these tables or charts spread in front of him. As Kelly looked into the crystal or scrying stone, Kelly would point with a rod to one of the other charts and say, He, the angel, points to column 6, row 31. D would then look it up and write down the letter. So Kelly would have needed to know the location of the symbols and letters on all the charts. And the 
finally convincing point is that the messages were given backwards because to pronounce the words forwards would release certain forces. So when it was written out, it then had to be reversed. It is conceivable that Kelly was clever enough to have invented Enochian and memorized 19 invocations in the language, but not that he could also have memorized with such an incredibly complicated code. Enochian has been ex extensively studied by many historians of magic, the latest being Stephen Skinner, who was engaged in writing a book on it, and they confirmed that it is a consistent language with no resemblance to any living language. As a consequence, occultists regard the Enochian language as the most convincing proof of the real existence of intelligent entities who exist independent of the human mind. The alternative hypothesis is that the language is a concoction from the subconscious minds of Dee and Kelly. No one has ever suggested that Dee himself invented it. His total honesty is generally acknowledged and it is true that we have no conception of the complexities of the unconscious there seems to be no doubt that it causes poltergeist phenomena and may be responsible for most spirit messages but then spirit messages are usually uncomplicated often childish and not in as complex we may surmise that it was a product of these super conscious mind or kelly's but this hypothesis is no more or less logical than a supposition that the language was dictated by disembodied entities. All of which may leave us unconvinced, but at least it enables us to understand Kenneth Grant, who was Crowley's pupil, can feel so certain that Lovecraft had some distinct knowledge of the densians of the dimensionless gap between universes. If these Enochian language came from these entities, or from any kind of spirit, then it is a highly plausible supposition that Lovecraft's strange mythology came from the same source, and Grant has argued his point convincingly in The Night Side of Eden, which is concerned with the dark side of the Tree of Life. Let me dot the I's and cross the T's. Lovecraft was a romantic world rejecter, not just a dreamer, but a man driven by an intense loathing of the real world surrounding him. I believe that he habitually performed some similar operation to Markin's hypnosis, not consciously, but like Markin, out of despair and exhaustion. One of the most important concepts in magic is that of the true will. Human beings seldom want anything very deeply. When they do, they set in motion a kind of will that is far more deep and powerful than everyday will. This is the will that the magician attempts to direct. A man who wants something badly, say a woman, or the downfall of an enemy, may direct it quite unconsciously. Lovecraft was not a man who used his will a great deal. He was a lazy dreamer. But periodically, he must have experienced moons of anguish in which his total rejection of the world around him produced the effect of awakening his true will. It should be noted that in order to produce these effects, no sustained concentration is necessary, only a particular kind of absorption. I can offer an example from my own experience. In 1968, I began to write a book called The God of the Labyrinth. It was intended to be a literary quest. The hero, Jared Sorm, was to engage, was to engage in research about an 18th century Irish rake named Esmond Donnelly, reputedly the author of a noted pornographic work. When I began it, it was my intention to write down a literary detective story in the manner of the Russian Irakli Andrionikov. However, at a certain point in the book, I realized that the plot was removing itself from my hands. What had happened was that my hero was becoming increasingly absorbed in the quests of Esmond until the spirit of Esmond begins to take him over. The odd thing was that I was also had a feeling that Esmond was somehow taking me over too. I knew, of course, that he was not a real person, that I've invented him. Yet, I had the odd feeling that he was real and he was trying to communicate with me. I had, of course, worked out the dates in detail that was necessary since his various encounters with contemporaries like Rousseau and Boswell, and I had to get the dates right. He was born in 1848 and set out on a grand tour of Europe. At the age of 17, in 1765, there was a point in the novel when the hero discovers that he was being taken over by Esmond. He is driving to Dublin, from the west, a hallucinatory sense of travelling by coach, as if setting out with Esmond on the Grand Tour. Driving into Dublin, he seems to see the Chapel Lizard Road, 
as it had been two centuries earlier. He is about to turn right over Grattan Bridge, feeling certain that this is his last opportunity to cross the river to Stevens Green. He has forgotten that O'Connell Bridge had been built since 1755. At this point, it struck me what I really wanted was some account of what Dublin was like in the 18th century. This house has thousands of books. I am sure there must be something among them. I went and searched through all the travel sections and came upon a book called Dublin Fragments by A. Peter 1928. It fell off the shelf and a map opened out at the back. I looked at it and my hair stood on end. It was a map of Dublin and its suburbs by J. Rock. I have it in front of me as I write and dedicated to George Putlin Square and corrected to the time 1765. It gave me of course all the information I needed. From then on until the end of the book I had an odd sense of Esmond's presence but the coincidence continued after it was published. I received a letter from a writer on magic, Francis King, asking me how I had discovered so much information about a secret society called the Cult of the Peacock. It was clear, he said, that was what I meant by the sect of the Phoenix, the sexual society of which Esmond finally becomes Grand Master. I had, it seemed, provided an interesting clue by mentioning that Edward Shellon was also a member. Shellon was an 18th century rake and pornographer who was, it seems, a member of the cult of the peacock, but Francis King was convinced that he was one of the few people in England who knew that Shellon had been a member of the cult peacock, and he wanted to know where I'd acquired my information. I had to reply that I'd invented it. The sect of the Phoenix was developed from a hint by Borgia. Edward Shellon's name appears in Bibliography of Prohibited Books. And this was, I agree, possibly coincidence. I can only say that from the moment I began to have a sense of Esmond's presence, I somehow expected such coincidence, and many more occurred which I have now forgotten. I had similar experiences stumble upon vital pieces of information exactly the right moment. On one occasion, a book fell off the shelf and opened itself at the page I was looking for. I am inclined to believe that this kind of synchronicity is engineered by the superconscious mind. When I began writing mysteries, I was fairly sure that the coincidences would start again, and they did, as if on cue. All this makes it easy for me to believe that once Lovecraft had become absorbed in the Hulu mythos, his inventions took on a life of their own, drawing their vitality from the collective unconscious, and 25 years after his death, Powell's and Bergier presented their own evidence for the conclusion that human beings were not the first intelligent creatures to walk the surface of this earth, that earth may have received visitors from space thousands, even millions of years before man appeared. Their theories were popularized by the Swiss Eric von Daniken, and in books The UFO Menace and Why They Are Watching Us, experts on unidentified flying objects have advanced theories about the aliens of space that sound remarkably like Lovecraft's later science fiction stories. If then, Kenneth Grant is correct in believing that Lovecraft's invention were truer than he supposed, it would also help to explain why the torments of self-division became more, not less acute after the call of Cthulhu. He had become a receptacle of hidden knowledge, a kind of priest. Other voices than his own were speaking through him. Grant argues that Lovecraft's poetry shows that he was aware of this, that he was playing with real occult knowledge, not fantasy. But if that is so, the knowledge was intuitive rather than conscious. Lovecraft continued to think of himself as a writer of weird tales, a journeyman storyteller who supplemented his income by revising hack work by other writers. Crowley may have been a thoroughly unsatisfactory character, but at least he regarded himself as a an emissary of unknown powers. He accepted his role as priest. Lovecraft was a thoroughly unsatisfactory priest who lacked belief in his inventions. He dropped some of his best work into drawers and forgot about it. He told his friends that he had decided to give up writing. In retrospect, we can see that he was a tragic case of self-misunderstanding, of underestimation of his own value, and the beginning of the last act of the tragedy was the writing of the novel The Shadow Out of Time, which some regard as his finest work. Here more clearly than ever, he writes about beings who exist in other dimensions, about minds capable of reaching beyond the stars, about a civilization millions of years older than that of man. The odd thing is that Lovecraft continued to feel that he was writing a horror story. Most readers will find this incomprehensible. These remarkable visions of the great old ones are not horrifying, they are fascinating. They galvanize the imagination, they arouse wonder, not fear. 
Yet Lovecraft's misunderstanding by his nature led him to write in the same old style, as if telling the story in a hoarse whisper. Instead of recognising that he was on the threshold of a new development, he probably assumed that his talents were waning. He stopped writing. And sometime in the year 1935, he developed cancer. It has often been pointed out that cancer seems to be associated with frustration. A doctor from the University of Texas Medical School, Augustin de la Pena, has even written a book suggesting that cancer is caused by what he calls information underload, another name for boredom. He is not denying that viral or chemical components may play a part, but he also suggests that there is another element associated with the central nervous system, information overload overload on the central nervous system tends too much to attend to inhibits cancer. He believes that while depression and boredom can lead to rapidly spreading cancers, when the information deficit reaches the some critical value, the central nervous system sends a non-specific signal to most somatic structure sites, indicating the need for novelty or information. Carciogenesis cancer is the body's mode of providing information novelty. Now, in the physical sense, Lovecraft spent most of his life in a state of information underload, but his imagination provided the novelty. From about 1930, he periodically assured his correspondent that he was about to give up writing because he had no more to say. Yet he continued to force himself to make the effort. In 1935, he finally stopped writing and the cancer began. He began The Shadow Without a Time in November 1934 and finished it in early 1935. We do not know precisely when the cancer first appeared, but the camp speaks of February 1937, over two years since the dysfunction that first appears, enough to suggest that there had been a correlation between the ending of the story and the beginning of the illness. If Lovecraft had consulted a doctor within the first six months of his illness, there would have been time to operate, but when cancer of the colon was finally diagnosed in March 1937, it was too late and had spread throughout his trunk. He died five days after being admitted to hospital. All of which brings me back to the present book and how it came about. In 1967, Les Sprague de Camp, who was then working on his biography of Lovecraft, went on a visit to India and the Middle East with a science fiction novelist called Alan Nurse. He was collecting material for the book Great Cities of the Ancient World. In Baghdad, he had met a member of the Iraqi Directorate General of Antiquities, with whom had been corresponding, and spent some time with him visiting archaeological sites. When this man learned of the camp's projected biography of Lovecraft, whose works are well known in the Middle East, he revealed that he was in a possession of a manuscript that might be of interest written in an ancient tongue related to Arabic. Understandably, the camp's first impulse was to refuse. He is not an Arabic scholar and felt he would have no use for such a manuscript. Besides, it is against the law to export manuscripts that could be classified as archaeological material, and he was afraid the customs might confiscate. Moreover, the official was vague about the work. All he seemed to be willing to say was that it was a magical manuscript. The subject was dropped, but shortly after the camp left Baghdad, the official again raised the matter this time obliquely. They were eating a meal in a restaurant, and Sprague, the camp, and Alan Nurse were the two of a dozen guests seated outside under a canvas awning. Sitting opposite them was a Palestinian professor from the University of Beirut. By an odd coincidence, he was translating my strength to dream into Arabic. The camp mentioned that we were friends, and the talk soon turned to Lovecraft. Sprague asked whether it would be accurate to translate al zif as the demonology. Lovecraft explains that the word is used by Arabs to denote the nocturnal sound of insects, which were believed to be the rustling of demons. The Palestinian professor said he had never heard of such a thing and at this point the official of the directorate of antiquities mentioned casually that the word derives from the ancient Akkadian language and that he had seen it on the head of a manuscript in his office trying to control his excitement the camp asked if he might see it and the official agreed to bring it in the next morning it proved to be written on a brown parchment in black ink and the camp was disappointed to find out that he was not able to make, make out any of the letters the official said it was written in a language called Duarik still spoken by a few old people in the village of Duria in the Kurdish part of northern Iraq when the camp asked if the manuscript was for sale the official asked a price that was high but not unreasonable. The camp was fairly certain that he could have necessarily resell the manuscript to the antiquity section of the Philadelphia Museum, so he bought it. He apparently had no trouble getting it out of the country. 
Back in America, he tried to get it translated and met with frustration. Experts said that it was in a language that resembled Persian, but that much of it seemed to be gibberish. They encouraged the camp, who pointed out that the word gibberish is derived from the Arab alchemist Geber, who was roughly contemporary with the, the legendary al Hazared. But when Reinhold Carter of the Metropolitan Museum declared that he was certain the manuscript was 19th century forgery, he became discouraged. In 1969, his interest revived again when he received a letter from the official in Baghdad offering in postscript to buy back the manuscript for more than he had paid. He expressed his willingness to discuss the matter but received no reply. Another Arab correspondent later told him that the official had been jailed for embezzling government funds. In 1973, the camp decided to publish the manuscript in facsimile and it appeared under the imprint of Oldswick Press Philadelphia under the title of Al Azif, the Necronomicon. In an introduction the camp told the story of how he had acquired it, but then went off into fiction claiming that three Arabic scholars who were undertaken to translate it had all disappeared, and that this was probably because they muttered the words under their breath as they wrote them down. In fact, his real reason for publishing the work was the hope that some Arabic scholar might become interested in the mystery. It is at this point that Robert Turner enters the story. He is the founder of a modern magical group called the Order of the Cubic Stone, which operates in Wolverhampton. The Order produces a half-yearly magazine called The Monolith. An account of the Order can be found in Francis King's book Ritual Magic in England. Like myself and Kenneth Grant, Robert Turner has long been convinced that the Lovecraft mythos is not simply a romantic invention, but it is based on an ancient magical tradition, an archetypal pattern underlying a uniform find a seemingly unconnected mass of magical and mythological data. Mr. Turner became convinced of the basic validity of magic for much the same reason as that I did myself. An engineer by profession, he admits that what led him to take an interest in magic and witchcraft was purely romantic impulse, a fascination with the mysterious and unusual. But as he began to study magical traditions that came from all over the world and from civilizations of the remote past, he was struck by the remarkably underlying consistency. If magic is really a product of superstition and ignorance, you would expect the magical beliefs of the Eskimos and the Indians of Peru to have nothing in common. In fact, there is an astounding similarity, which has repeatedly been pointed out by anthropologists from Sir James Fraser to Joseph Campbell, whose monumental work, The Masks of God, is the best modern introduction on the subject. An American Indian shaman or witch doctor would have no difficulty whatsoever in understanding the magical procedures of a colleague from New Guinea or Latvia. Archaeological discoveries reveal that the magic of ancient Babylon or Thebes was not very different than that at Paracolysis or Cornelius Agrippa. Of course, the language and the symbols are different, just as the language of the Egyptian mathematics is different than that of the Romans or the Arabs, yet the underlying concepts show astonishing similarities. All this led Robert Turner to feel that the basic laws of magic are as objectively valid as those of physics. The chief difference is simply that physics is concerned with the external world, magic is concerned with the hidden world of the human psyche and its mysterious relationship to the external universe. Mr. Turner has explained something of his own conception of the nature of magic in his commentary on the Necronomicon. So that all that needs to be said here is that when he began to read Lovecraft's Thulu stories, he experienced a strong conviction that the mythos was not a creation of Lovecraft's imagination. It was grounded in some magical tradition as the writing of Hermes and John Dee. His first suspicion, he says, is that Lovecraft was himself a practicing adept or at least a member of some magical order. When he read Lovecraft's letters he was astonished and baffled to discover that Lovecraft apparently regarded all occultism as a sign of feeble-mindedness. Yet when he read the major works of the Cthulhu mythos, The Mountains of Madness, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, The Shadow Out of Time, The Dunwich Horror, he began to experience the sense of total conviction that Lovecraft knew more about magic than he'd been prepared to acknowledge to his correspondence. It was at about this time, 1972, that Kenneth Grant's magical revival appeared and Mr. Turner was the first inclined to accept Grant's view, that this was a case of unconscious insight as the answer to the problem. In fact, he remains convinced that Grant was fundamentally correct, yet he was still inclined to suspect that Lovecraft's knowledge of magical texts were greater than Grant believed, and that it was based on certain works that would have been easily accessible to Lovecraft, both 
in Providence and New York. Robert Turner and I met through our mutual interest in ritual magic. I was intrigued when he told me a theory that Lovecraft's mythology was based on the ancient magical traditions, particularly when he told me that he had found one of the leading clues in my own book, The Strength to Dream, in which I compared the Lovecraft mythology to Madame Blavatsky's. I have noted that Blavatsky speaks of cyclopean wounds and colossal stones in The Secret Doctrine, and the secret doctrine is supposed to be basically an immense commentary on the oldest manuscript in the world, the Book of Desian. Blavatsky claims to possess the book on a collection of palm leaves made penetrable to water, fire and air by some specific unknown process. Like most non-theosophists, I had always been inclined to take the view that the Book of Desian was an invention of that wily old occultist, yet many reputable people, including the well-known Buddhist Christmas Humphreys, have asserted their belief of its genuineness. One writer, Siri Madhava Ashish, has devoted two books to analysing the stanzas of Denzian on the assumption that they are precisely what Madame Blavatsky claimed they were. I had to agree with Robert Turner that if the book of Dizian was genuine, it could well be the origin of the Necronomicon. Unfortunately, that still applies if it was Madame Blavatsky's own invention, but Lovecraft could have borrowed some of his mythology from the secret doctrine. It was about this time that I heard from another friend, George Hay, the chairman of the H.G. Wells Society, of which I'm a member. George Hay is a historian of science fiction, and he had been asked by the publishers of the present volume to edit a series of essays about Lovecraft and the Necronomicon. It would, of course, treat the Necronomicon as Lovecraft's own invention. George asked me, if I would be willing to contribute an article. I told him about Robert Turner's Dizian theory and suggested that he might ask Robert to write about it. But by the time he approached Robert Turner, the latter was already pursuing a new line of inquiry that Lovecraft might have had access to various medieval grimoires like the Sword of Moses and that this could explain the sense of authenticity of his references to magics. This, I must admit, struck me as unlikely. I felt that Robert was perhaps allowing himself to be led astray by wishful thinking. All the same, I agreed with George Hay that his views deserve the hearing in the projected volume. Yet our first major breakthrough came from a completely different source. In the summer of 1976, I happened to mention our Lovecraft project to a friend called Dr. Karl Tausk of the Vienna Technological Institute. And Karl made me blink by remarking casually that he had heard that Lovecraft's father was an Egyptian Freemason. I asked him where he'd obtained this information. But he was vague. He said that he had overheard it during some late night discussion after an academic meeting. Since he had read little of Lovecraft, he had made no attempt to learn more. But he thought he could remember who said it and promised to inquire for me when he returned to Vienna. And now at last I began to feel that I might be onto something important. I had just read the Camp's biography of Lovecraft and knew that almost nothing is known about Howard's father, Howard Winfield Lovecraft, who died of syphilis when Howard was a child. Of English descent, he spoke with an English accent. Winfield Lovecraft was known to acquaintances as the pompous Englishman, and at the age of 35, he married Susan Phillips, a daughter of a wealthy Providence businessman. At the time, he was a salesman for the Gorham Silver Company of Providence. Four years later, Winfield Lovecraft went on a business trip to Chicago and began to show signs of mental breakdown. He, was a, he declared that the chambermaid had insulted him and that his wife was being attacked in the upstairs room. He was declared legally incompetent and placed in a lunatic asylum where he died five years later. General paralysis of, of the insane, the final stage of syphilis, takes about 20 years to manifest itself, by which time the disease is long past infectious stage, but it can still be passed on genetically. Fortunately, Howard seems to have been unaffected. Now, it would have been no matter for surprise to have discovered that Winfield Lovecraft was a Freemason. Modern Freemasonry, which began in England about 1770, had reached Philadelphia as early as 1730, and had spread quickly to Boston, New York, Charleston, Portsmouth, and other towns. The American enthusiasm for the idea of fraternity ensured its adoption across the continent, and most American cities now have their Grand Masonic temples. While European Freemasonry maintained the traditions of the secret society, American Freemasonry became a respectable club to which most leading businessmen were to belong. As one historian has remarked, American Freemasonry abandoned the idea of selectivity and went in for the theory of numbers. Since 
Winfield Lovecraft was a successful young businessman operating mainly in Boston. We might almost take it for granted that he was a Freemason, but Egyptian Freemasonry is a totally different matter. Most historians agree that the Freemasonry originated in ancient Egypt. The Masons were a guild of temple architects and craftsmen, but Egyptian Masonry was created or revived by the famous magician and imposter Count Cagliostro around the year 1778. Cagliostro was admitted to the Esperance Lodge of Freemasons in April 1777 in London. He claims that soon after this he bought a manuscript containing an account of the original form of masonry as it existed in Egypt. Thereupon Cagliostro declared himself to be an Egyptian mason and he carried his proselytizing all over Europe. In Lightspeak after a Masonic banquet, Cagliostro told the head of the lodge that if he did not adopt Egyptian rite, he would feel the hand of God. When the man committed suicide a few days later, it was regarded as the fulfillment of Cagliostro's prophecy, and Egyptian Freemasonry was suddenly taken very seriously. Even his most skeptical biographers have no doubt that Cagliostro's enthusiasm for Egyptian Masonry was totally sincere. For seven years, Cagliostro's star was in the ascendant. Then came the affair with the diamond necklace when Cagliostro's friend Cardinal Rohan became the dupe of a confidence trickster, the Countess della Motte Valois. Cagliostro was tried as an accomplice, but he was not and was acquitted. But his absurd behavior at the trial and his preposterous story of my life, which he read aloud in court, made him a laughingstock and he was banished to London. He made the mistake of going to Rome, was arrested as a Freemason and died in the papal dungeons in 1795. By then, the French Revolution had taken place, thousands of aristocrats had died in the terror and hundreds more fled to America. Obviously, these included many that Cagliostro had initiated into Egyptian masonry. Posterity has decided that Cagliostro was basically a fraud, yet, as I pointed out in the occult, he was also a magician who possessed genuine powers. These included clairvoyance, prophecy and healing. The latter was highly developed. What was the difference between Egyptian masonry and the usual variety? Fortunately, there is no need to speculate. A. E. Waite has described Egyptian Freemasonry in length in his New Encyclopedia of Freemasonry from 1923 as to the less esoteric form of masonry into which Cagliostro was first initiated in London. We have a description of it in W. R. H. S. Trowbridge's book on Cagliostro 1910. Cagliostro was led into the presence of the other brothers and he was hoisted up to the ceiling by means of a rope to symbolize his utter reliance on the will of heaven. Then he was blindfolded, handed a load pistol and ordered to blow his brains out. When he showed a natural hesitation he was ordered to take the oath, swearing to obey his superiors without question. Once again the pistol this time unloaded was handed to him and Cagliostro placed it rather shakily against his forehead and pulled the trigger. Another pistol was fired at the same time and he was given a blow to the head. Then the bandage was removed and Cagliostro was declared a mason. Clearly, the right of the Esperance Lodge was fairly uncomplicated, not to say crude. Cagliostro's Egyptian right was a different matter. The candidate had to be a mason already. Before the ceremony, he was left in the room with a picture of a pyramid, probably the Great Pyramid of Chios, upon which he had to meditate. Then, after knocking seven times, he was admitted, admitted to the foot of the throne, and a master dressed in white then delivered an extremely long discourse under 16 headings, beginning with natural and supernatural philosophy and including a section on the foundation of masonry by Solomon and the use of occult forces. All this makes it clear that the difference between ordinary masonry and Egyptian masonry was that the ordinary masonry was and still is a straightforward variant of Christianity, while Egyptian masonry was based on the hermetic philosophy, that is, on magic. Solomon was not only the builder of the temple, but he was also a legendary magician, reputed to be the author of the famous medieval grimoire, the Key of Solomon. Moreover, the legendary founder of magic, Hermes Trismegitios, came from Egypt where he was known as Thot. The most celebrated body of magical and mystic writings, the Corpus Hermeticum, including the famous Emerald Tablet, was attributed to the thrice great Hermes. We now know that most of the corpus dates back to the 2nd century AD. This is why Cagliostro firmly believed that Egyptian Freemasonry was superior to ordinary masonry because it went back to its origins in magic and occult philosophy. The ordinary mason was expected to know his Bible, 
The Egyptian mason was expected to know something of astrology, alchemy, mystical philosophy and ritual magic. Cagliostro himself knew something, if not a great deal, of all of these. The masses were expected to know much, much more. The century after Cagliostro's death saw a remarkable revival of the magical tradition. Suddenly magic was again a serious subject for study. In France, he was, it was given a tremendous impetus with the writings of Eliphras Levi, particularly the transcendental magic, which related the tarot cards to the Jewish Kabbalah. MacGregor's Matos is one of the founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, translated the Key of Solomon and the Sacred Magic of Abermelum the Mage. All kinds of strange Masonic sects sprang up in England, some of them like the Grand Lodge of Memphis and the Hermetic Lodge of Egypt, obviously offshoots of Cagliostro's Egyptian masonry. Kenneth Mackenzie, an eccentric scholar who compiled the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, went to Paris to sit at the feet of Eliza Levi and to learn from him about the Hermetic Order of Egypt. In short, by the end of the 19th century, magic and masonry had become closely connected, and the man who, more than any others, was responsible for their association was Cagliostro. All of which explains my excitement when I heard the suggestion that Lovecraft's father was an Egyptian Freemason. If this was true, then there was already magic so to speak, in the family, and H.P. Lovecraft's interest in it may have been originally stimulated by his father, for Winfield Lovecraft was not under permanent restraint in an institution after his original breakdown in Chicago. The cat makes it clear that he lived at home much of the time, being admitted to hospital only during periods of hallucination. So during the most formative period of his young life, between the ages three and eight, Howard must have seen a great deal of his father. The lonely man, like a sickly child, spent much of his time confined to the house. And no doubt the lonely man talked in his rambling way of all kinds of things that once interested him. Carl Tausk did what he promised. He tracked down the acquaintance who had made the comment about Lovecraft's father. It was a man he had known of on and off for several years. Dr. Stanislaus Hintunstrasser is the author of A History of Monetary Policy in the Last Decade of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Born in Lekasitz, Silesia on the 23rd of August 1896, Dr. Hintunstrasser gained his doctorate in political theory at the University of Dresden in 1925. He lived most of his adult life in Vienna. His wife, who was the niece of von Hindenburg, inherited a country estate at Modensee See near Salzburg, and the Hindenstrassers divided their time equally between there and Vienna. Following a nervous breakdown in 1933, due to his fears that Hitler was about to rise to power, Hindenstrasser became president of the Carl Jung Society in Zurich, where he lived for two years. It was Jung who lent him a book called The Law of Psychic Phenomena, by Thomas J. Hudson. This was not, as it sounds, a book about the occult, but an attempt to examine the vast potential of man's mind, including dreams, hypnosis, and telepathy. As a result of reading the book, Dr. Hintonstrasser became fascinated by this problem of the untapped potential of the human mind and began to study the history of magic as a psychical phenomena. The result was the Prolegamia zu einer Geschichte Magie, in three volumes published in 1943. The entire edition was seized and destroyed by the Nazis although one copy is known to have survived. Dr. Hintenstosser was only saved from the concentration camp by the personal intervention of Himmler himself. After the war, Hintenstrasser founded the Salzburg Institute for the Study of Magic and Occult Phenomena. Understandably, Karl Tausk was completely unaware of Hintenstrasser's interest in such matters, as were most of his colleagues in Vienna. This was not because Hintenstrasser made any secret of his interest in magic, but simply because he regarded it as a hobby, a relaxation from his study of economic history. It turned out that Hintenstrasser knew of my work. He had actually reviewed the German edition of The Outsider in the Proceedings of the Institute, admirer of the Mind Parasites, the first novel I wrote for Derlich in the Lovecraftian tradition. He wrote to me via Carl, telling me that he could not go into detail about the source of the knowledge about Lovecraft's father but that he could state categorically not only that Winfield Lovecraft was an Egyptian Freemason, but that he possessed at least two magical works, the famous Picatrix of Masalama in Abham al Magirthri, also known as the pseudo Magitrix, and God's Zir's book of the essence of the soul. At my request, Dr. Hinterstrasser wrote me a letter I had made his permission to quote in our book on Lovecraft. In fact, I had printed it in full with a few minor omissions. He writes as if 
we had no previous correspondence, but this is because I'd asked him to do so. In the letter, he makes the highly controversial statement that Cagliostro bequeathed to his followers certain manuscripts, including the original Necronomicon. Now, when Dr. Hinton Strasser made this statement in a letter dated the 4th of August 1976, he took my breath away. I wrote back immediately asking him to elaborate. It was all intensely frustrating because Hinton Strasser's English was no more than adequate and his letter to me had been translated by Carl Taus. Carl was in Italy when I wrote to Hinton Strasser so that it was two months before a reply reached me. In it, Hinton Strasser states, The Necronomicon is not a single work by one man, but a compilation of magical materials from Cadia, Babylonia, Persia, and Israel, probably made by Al-Akidi Yabub Ibn Ishak Ibn Shabab Al-Kidi, who died about AD 50 claims to contain the remnants of a magical tradition predating mankind. He goes on to state that the section that became known as the Book of Secret Names is in fact the ninth chapter of the second part of this work. For all this, I assumed that the work we call the Necronomicon was only a small part of a much larger work, and I also asked Hintenstrasser the title of the larger work. He was never clear about this, although in his last letter to me, April 1977, he speaks of the Kippap Manani al Ats or the Grand Compilation. However, I discovered that this is simply the Arabic name for the Book of the Essence of the Soul, which he referred to in his first letter. Hinton Strasser's death on the 10th of October 1977 presented me from pressing for a clearer explanation. But he made it plain as a comprehensive treatise on magic, much of which is derived from the tablets from the library of Asur Banipal. It seems to include an immense amount of material that would, we would now consider scientific or philosophical, for example, a long section on the nature of man, as well as chapters on astrology, alchemy, color lore, and the making of talismans. But the ninth chapter of part two is entitled of the history of the ancient ones, and this seems fairly clearly to be the basis of the Necronomicon. In reply to my question, Hinterstrasser states out that he did not process a copy of the Necronomicon, but that he had seen a copy in Boston. Again, I had no time to question him further, but it was worth bearing in mind that Winfield Lovecraft's business centered around Boston, and that the city was one of the earliest sites of the Masonic Temple. I print Hinterstrasser's letter. Now, all this would, I agree, be intolerably frustrating if it were all we could discover about the Necronomicon. Fortunately, this is not so. Hinton Strother's letter so fascinated Robert Turner that he was stimulated to begin his investigations all over again, this time in the British Museum. In his second letter to me, Hinton Strother's remarked that a copy of Al Kindi's compilation was catalogued by the librarian of King Rudolph II in Prague, Robert recalled that Rudolph II was the king with whom John Dee and Edward Kelly spent several years in Prague. And according to Lovecraft, John Dee's translated the Necronomicon had both assumed that this was Lovecraft's invention. But if Lovecraft's father actually possessed some magical books, including the Secret Names chapter of al Kindi, and if Lovecraft later bases Cthulhu mythology on the Secret Names, then nothing seems more like than that the chapter in the possession of Winfield Lovecraft was indeed Dee's translation of the Necronomicon, copied by him during his time in Prague. One of the earliest and most exciting discoveries was the letter to John Dee concerning the town of Dunwich, partly submerged by the sea. Dunwich, pronounced Dunwich, still exists in East Suffolk, four miles southwest of Southwold, and Bartholomew's Gazetteer states that it was once the capital of East Anglia. Dee was fascinated by the results of excavations at Dunwich, particularly by the discovery of huge stone caskets shaped like a man. The parallels between Lovecraft's Dunwich and Dunwich described in Gene Carter's guide convinced Robert Turner that Lovecraft went to the trouble of finding out a great deal about the English village. Further study of Dee's manuscript in the British Museum led him to the Liber Logareth of Dee. A ciphered manuscript in his own contribution to the volume, he tells how, with the help of a computer expert, David Langford, he proved beyond all doubt that this was the encoded manuscript that Dee had copied in the library of Rudolph II. David Langford had contributed a, se a section describing exactly how he deciphered. Parts of it are beyond my comprehension, but I think it's important that this explanation should be printed in full. This strikes me as one of the most remarkable pieces of historical detective work since Campoleon's decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. Here at last, then, we were able to present readers with a large part of the forbidden chapter of al Kindi's Treatise on Magic. At a later date, it is proposed to print the whole text together with the full commentary. Robert Turner is also 
also working at present on a detailed comparison of Lovecraft's Dunwich and the English Village, which will be included. The publisher of this book insists that what is important is to offer the results of our researches together with a sampling of the Necronomicon. The preparation of the complete edition may take several years. I must warn that admirers of Lovecraft who are hoping to discover terrible forbidden secrets will be disappointed. The material is exciting enough to students of magic, but it will mean little to the average reader. But then, the same is true of the works of the Key of Solomon, the sacred magic of Abramel and the Maj, and the great classical works in alchemy studied by Jung. It took Jung 20 years of study to uncover the secrets of the alchemist, and even now I am far from sure that these explanations were correct. On the other hand, students of magic may find these pages among the most exciting they have ever been investigated. The starting point of most modern magicians is the magic of the Golden Dawn. This, in turn, is based on the Kabbalistic tradition, basically Jewish, a tradition of mysticism. There can be no doubt that the Secret Names is based on a far older magical tradition that was already ancient when it was recorded in Sumeria. It is true that by the time it reached John D, it had been adulterated with Egyptian, Persian and Arabic magic, and even with Gnosticism and Greek mysticism. Yet scholars who have seen the text believe that it should be possible to remove Christians layer by layer, like cleaning a picture until the remains of the original are revealed. For readers who know little or nothing about magic, I would suggest George Cavillet's The Sacred Magician, A Ceremonial Diary, Paladin Books 1976, as a short and painless introduction to the Necronomicon. It is simply the diary of a modern magician describing how he spent six months performing a magical operation described by the Abramelum, the Maj, and what results he obtained. This should convince anyone that the practice of magic is a long, tedious and extremely precise business. Anyone who cares to repeat George Cavillier's experiences only has to buy, borrow or borrow from the library a copy of McGregor Matter's translation of the Abamel and the Maj. But he should be warned that once begun, the operation must be completed according to the magicians. The consequences can be extremely unpleasant. Alistair Crowley has described in his confessions how he performed the operation at his house by Loch Ness and actually saw demonic entities parading around the room. We may dismiss him as a liar, but all serious students of magic would accept that the correct performance of the operation should produce results like this. The secret names describe a similar operation by summoning the old ones. It is not printed in full here, although any student of magic will find it easy enough to reconstruct from the sections offered in these pages. I am unwilling at this stage to venture an opinion about whether it would actually work as such. To begin with, it seems impossible that we no longer st understand certain operations prescribed in the ritual. And then, of course, there is always the possibility that the whole thing is a rigmarole of superstitious nonsense, and that the old ones never existed. Only one thing is quite certain. That once the ritual is published in full, groups of magicians from all over the world will attempt to summon Hastur, Naralapothep, and Cthulhu. It should then be fairly clear soon whether the old ones have any existence in fact. For what it is worth, I venture the opinion that the really important work on the Necronomicon will be carried out not only by magicians, but by followers of Carl Jung, who will regard as a document describing so far unexpected layers of the unconscious mind. It is, I agree, infuriating that there should be so many loose ends to this story. Obviously, this will not always be so. Even now, I have asked an expert researcher to find out all he can about Egyptian masonry in Boston in the late 19th century and, if possible, about Winfield Lovecraft's involvement. There must undoubtedly be records describing his initiation, what grade he achieved. I am at present in correspondence with a Czech scholar who will attempt to trace the original compendium by Alkindi in the library of the half-mad Emperor Rudolf II. He had been able to tell me that when D and Kelly left Prague for Leipzig, May 1686, the papal nuncio submitted a document to Rudolf accusing them of conjuring up forbidden spirits. Had D been trying at a ritual of the secret names? Since the communist authorities frown on the whole idea of occultism, my correspondent will have to proceed with caution, so his quest may possibly have less chance of success than that of my American friend. But what seems to me perfectly clear at this stage is not only that Lovecraft learned about the chapter of the secret names from his father, but that the actual document actually passed into his hands. There are far too many similarities between his Cthulhu mythos and Dee's cipher manuscript to admit any other explanation. This again raises some interesting questions, to which my old friend the camp is at this moment seeking answers. How did Howard come into possession of the book? Since his father died when he was eight, we can hardly suppose that Winfield Lovecraft handed it to him. 
Besides, it would presumably have been the property of the Boston Temple. It seems equally unlikely that Susie Lovecraft, Howard's mother, carefully preserved it and handed it to her son when he came of age. She was a typically puritanical daughter of New England and would probably have burned it. Besides, her husband's death from syphilis must have left the most unpleasant impression on her. She probably regarded his Masonic activities with horror, associating them with his sinful past. We must suppose that Winfield Lovecraft's papers lay untouched in his desk until his son, in his tireless search for reading material, discovered the chapter of secret names, and probably the other two books mentioned by Hintenstrasser. And this in itself could explain a great deal about Lovecraft's development as a writer. He grew up with a father who was drifting into total insanity and who suffered from hallucinations. This we know from the camp. Surely some of these hallucinations must have been of entities he had read about in the Necronomicon to give the secret names its more familiar title. And surely in that case, these names would become the bogeymen of Lovecraft's childhood. When he eventually found the manuscript, he must have surely have felt the hair stirring on his head. Any modern child who treasures a pornographic magazine under the mattress of his bed would understand the sensation. This was truly forbidden, a secret that could never be shared with his mother or aunts. Why was the young Lovecraft so obsessed with astronomy? Was it because he wondered whether it really came from out there? What is perfectly clear is that at the age of 14 or so, he had reacted against the whole notion. He must have decided to dismiss the bogies of his childhood, to take his stand on reason and logic. Then why, in that case, did he begin to write horror stories? A man who possessed by the visions of science is more likely to write science fiction, H.G. Wells being an obvious example. Yet from the beginning, there was no doubt that this champion of reason and sanity was obsessed by charnel houses and monsters and evil entities, and it seems that at a certain point he decided that he might as well exercise the bogies of his childhood by making use of them in his fiction. It was probably a gesture of bravado, a cry of, I don't believe in you. From there can be no doubt whatsoever that Lovecraft did not believe in Cthulhu and Yog Sothoth. His letters make it clear that he remained a convinced rational for most of his life. In a recent letter, Carl Tausk made another interesting point. When Lovecraft began to publish the Cthulhu stories, there must have been many Egyptian masons who realized precisely what he was doing. Surely they must have contacted him. If so, then the development of the Cthulhu mythos in his stories was not simply a gesture of emancipation from childhood bogies. It was a gesture of defiance at the Egyptian Freemasons. Any reader who wants to pursue these speculations further only has to read the camp's biography on Lovecraft and Lovecraft's own letters published in five volumes by Arkham House Press. Did he, as Robert Turner is inclined to believe, become slowly convinced of the reality of the old ones? Was he possessed in the last years of his life? Does this explain his lethargy and the low temperature of his body? But I can see no reason why I should end this introduction on a note of occult speculation. I have no intention of trying to make the reader's flesh creep. Lovecraft spent his life trying to do precisely that and finally gave up on boredom. Let's not surmise that we actually know what we can deduce from reason. We know that the secret names really existed, although we do not know whether Lovecraft called it the Necronomicon or whether this was the actual title of the manuscript. We are pretty certain that Winfield Lovecraft possessed a copy either of the whole or of fragments. We are inclined to accept that this copy passed the Lovecraft and became the basis of the Cthulhu stories. As far as literary history is concerned, this is all we need to know. From our point of view, it makes not the slightest difference whether Kenneth Grant was right and the old ones really existed, or perhaps they really do exist. No doubt students of magic will feel that the questions deserve to be pursued. No doubt there are many readers of Lovecraft who take the opposite of view and regard the misgivings of the prospect of the great Cthulhu being aroused from his long sleep in Rael. But the facts, as Mr. Gagrain states, are all that really concern us. And I think that no one will disagree that in this case, the facts are as fascinating and as extraordinary as anything in the Cthulhu mythos.